Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And joining me today would be typically the governor of Beckerville, Mr. Michael Becker. But he is, again, on a due diligence assignment and could not join us. So we wish Michael and his group at SPI a lot of luck. And they're working on another transaction. That guy is the hardest working guy I know and does a great job. So in the podcast today, it is story time. Story time is one of my favorite, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite things. Whether you were a child and people sat around, told you stories, and uh, gave you some information about what was going on there, I love story time because it's an educational piece from people that have actually done what you want to do, and that's get in the multifamily business. But after you get in the multifamily business, there's some crazy stories that go on. So we're going to talk a little bit about story time, and we have uh, Darwin German. Darwin German, thank you for coming into the podcast today. We appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. So Darwin has been on the podcast, what, about two years ago? About two years ago. Maybe two, two and a half years ago. He has some great words of wisdom, some great insight of some of the business that he has done in the past. Darwin, let me just kind of set the table for you, for him, is that uh, he's been in the multifamily business, I'm going to say 20, 25, 28 years. 28 years, and he has owned, him and his group have owned thousands of apartment buildings, and so... When you own thousands of apartment buildings, you have thousands and thousands of tenants. And if you have thousands and thousands and of tenants, you typically are going to have uh, a couple stories, a couple stories that give you some uh, information that you think could be pretty funny or in this case, pretty useful. So we're going to talk a little bit about owning multifamily and having some opportunities to uh, tell some stories about what's going on. So we're going to tell Fun <laughs> fun and interesting stories in multifamily. So Darwin, uh, thanks for being with us. We appreciate that. Again, if people don't know you, tell us a little bit about your background. Basically, I actually grew up in Southern California and my dad and grandfather and great-grandfather, they were all auto mechanics, but they always said, invest in real estate. And so they had houses, small apartment buildings, things like that. So as a young child, I would be woken up every morning on the weekends or in summertime every day to go do make readies on apartments or go do landscaping. I even roofed a building when I was 12 years old. Oh my God. So yeah, I've, I grew up in it, but really I count my experience at 28 years starting in about 1990 when I actually got involved in real estate. So when you say you got involved here, you came from Southern California and you came to Texas to manage portfolios, manage buildings that your dad was buying and the, the team was buying. So talk a little bit about uh, getting into ownership. Well, first, backing up, I was extremely fortunate that my father was involved in real estate. So I learned about it and he had a client that came into some money and said, hey, we want to invest that. Where's the best place to go? And my dad said, Dallas, Fort Worth. And they basically said, okay, here's $20 million. Go invest it. Oh, you're doing really good. Here's another 20 million. Oh, you're doing really great. Here's another 20 million. You're doing it great. Here's another 20 million. So $120 million. And five years later, we bought over 5,000 units, most of them in Dallas-Fort Worth. Well, at the beginning stages of that, I actually moved to Texas to go ahead and, and be part of that team, the boots on the ground here in Texas, to be involved with due diligence and management and really cutting my teeth on that portfolio. So let's kind of fast forward to story time. I love okay. <laughs> I love story time. So we're going to tell, uh, I want to have you kind of expand on some, some different topics. And what we have done is I've kind of created a list of a bunch of stuff. And I'm going to have Darwin tell us a little bit about uh, what he remembers of that. So the first one up is property on the news. What did that oh, mean? That was a lot of fun. Uh, not only have we had over 7,000 apartment units, but we've also had 300,000 square feet of commercial properties. And one of those, I get a call one day and said, Hey, I think your property's on the news. And I said, Oh no, not possible. Turn on the news. And there's a scene being filmed from a helicopter with a building that's on fire. And yes, it is my building. So 
not too strange to have a fire, but when I started reading the script and hearing what they were talking about, they said, property's on fire, cyanide gas leaking out of the building, the city is evacuated. So that, oh my gosh. that makes you a little bit concerned then of what's going to happen. Was it an apartment building or was it? Uh, this was actually a commercial property. One of the commercial properties. Have, I had. have you had fires on your buildings? You know, whether it's caused by the tenants or whatever, have you had fires in your properties? Oh, at least one a year. <laughs> so it's not that we like fires on buildings, but tell me a little bit about the benefit of having a fire on a building. It's funny. A lot of investors say, well, you know, they think about all these worries. What if there's a fire? Well, the beautiful thing is actually we have plenty of insurance to go ahead and cover that fire and we get a brand new building out of it that we usually get additional rent for. Plus on that building, we get higher rents and they pay the rents while it's being rebuilt. On one particular property, we had a fire on a building. Well, we only paid $30,000 a door for it. Well, to rebuild it at that time, it was over $80,000 a door. So we basically sold that building to the insurance company. They gave us the $80,000 and we sold our $30,000 a unit <laughs> property for $80,000 a door on that one building and then turned it into a park. Now, the same thing happens on fire versus hail claims on the roof. Have you had a hail claims on some of your, your properties? <laughs> all, <laughs> all the time. We live in Texas. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we don't even budget usually for replacing roofs because every three to five years we have hail storms that replace the roofs for us. And uh, unless you're buying a property, which we've done that on numerous occasions where it's not covered under insurance, uh, we have to replace those. But hail is not a big threat either because we have insurance that covers that. That's great. Let's go on to uh, topic number two. So tell us a little bit about crazy, weird contract in terms. There's this one property I worked on for three years. I was working directly with the owner and they would give me information about the property. And I'd say, hey, here's what I want to do. I want to buy your property for X. And here's what I would do. Here's my plan. Well, I kept on doing that for three years and they'd always implement whatever I said. And eventually I said, forget it. I'll just buy your property. What do you want for it? Okay, good. I'll take it. I knew it was a good deal. But part of that, we started negotiating terms. One of the crazy terms in that contract was we were required to keep feeding the stray cats. (laughs) That was in the contract. That was in the contract that we were required to feed the cats. So they eventually sold the property to you and you have had to feed the cats We had to feed the cats and the owner, actually the seller, had an office building across the street so they would come check on the cats. So we had to keep on feeding them. There was a little bit of contentiousness because the manager's like, why are we feeding these cats? I'm saying, hey, we're legally obligated to per our contract. How many cats were there? I think there was about half a dozen stray cats and we did take some of those down and have them spayed and neutered. That way we didn't have more cats to feed. Yeah. So- You talked about that you pursued this seller for three years. Tell me a little bit about that. I mean, does that happen very often where, I mean, this was an off-market deal, obviously. Yes. You you got involved trying to buy the property. Any backstory for what happens over three years trying to convince somebody to sell? It was ridiculous. They had a property in in a nice area and they wanted, they thought about tearing it down and building a medical office building. And so a commercial broker who was working with them on that said, I don't think that's the best call. And he called me in to meet with the owners. And I said, look, I can increase the value of this property by a million dollars in 90 days Mm -hmm. because they had never owned apartments. They bought it because they needed a parking lot, extra parking for their employees at their office building next door. And they had never owned it free and clear, never made a penny on it over the 10 years that they owned it and completely... I don't want to say mismanaged. It was very well taken care of asset, but it was not making any money. Mm -hmm. And so I was telling them, Hey, I'll do this. I'll make this money for you. I'll do. And they started implementing everything over that period of time. They were just using me for information. I finally said, forget it here. What price do you want? Great deal. As a matter of fact, that one particular deal, we actually bought that uh, almost three years ago. And even though I paid them their price, we have now made an average return of 47.4% return for the, on that property over the last 33 months. That's pretty good. So dealing directly with an owner, though, they're not motivated to sell. They don't have to sell. 
That's one of the reasons why I like going through brokers is that they have committed to sell it if they've listed the property for sale. Wow. So how big of a property was it? This one was actually relatively small, 90 units. Okay. I mean, decent size unit, good economies of scale at least. Now, when you buy some property, sometimes on an acquisition, you've had to put some construction together on the property. So you acquire a property, you rehab the property, and are you the kind of the general contractor or you, do you hire that out? And talk a little bit about some, you know, we're in October, we're going to Halloween here soon. Talk about some horror stories on construction of multifamily properties for the rehabbing of the property itself. Oh, we actually have a great horror story on that, a property that we purchased. And the capital expense number grew and grew and grew because there was a Band-Aid on everything. And we actually filmed this whole process. We actually, we wanted to do a TV show. We actually filmed nine episodes of a TV show on all the construction horrors. Wow. But it's just sitting in a box, not doing anything. We're trying to put it on YouTube or something. But there was every problem imaginable. The scariest one was when we were replacing the driveway and they were grinding up the asphalt. Well, the previous owner had run a power line had run new power underneath the asphalt. Well, he just put it like three inches under the asphalt and then put a speed bump over it. Mm. Well, we couldn't tell anything was there. Well, the paving company had a big grinding machine grinding all that up and it grabbed that main power line and ripped it right out of the ground. Wow. If we would have been doing saw cuts, somebody would have been killed Mm -hmm. because there was no way of marking that. It wasn't to code because they were doing everything as they should not be. Mm-hmm. And that could have been a real dangerous situation. You guys always, when you acquire properties, you do your due diligence up front, and then you kind of have an understanding of how much money you're going to spend on the property. Anything where you thought it was going to be X and all turned out to be three times X or four times X? Well, we like to be conservative in our numbers. Yeah. So we pretty much have everything budgeted in there pretty good with a good cushion. We have a cushion in every single line item than a bottom line cushion. Sure. But there are times where there's more that we have to do. And because of that, other items get squeezed. Talk about the transaction you did over in Farmer's Branch where you put windows on that property. (laughs) <laughs> and I think what you originally were thinking is that you were just going to keep the older windows, which was a single pane. The property was built 1960 what? That property was actually built in 1968. 68, pitch roof property, individual HVACs in the property. On half of it. The on other half, half had a chiller. But they had older windows on the property. And the lender required Darwin to go in there and put brand new double pane energy efficient windows on the property and what type of, you know, again, it's not you, but it's us. We're, <laughs> we're your largest partner on the Absolutely. deal. What type of an impact did brand new windows have on these older properties? Well, on that particular property, it, it really did aggravate us that a inspector, it wasn't even the bank. They had an inspector go out there and say, oh, they're single pane glass. Those will have to be replaced sometime soon. So the bank said, the inspector said they have to be replaced. So you have to replace them. So that was a big problem because our first bid was $500,000 to replace all the windows. Now, I like to just put solar screens over the windows It helps with the utility cost. It cleans up the place. But having to replace those, first bid was $500,000. We had to beat that down and beat that down and beat that down until we got it done for about $190,000. But the lender required us to do it. But it made the property look gorgeous. It certainly did. In fact, I I drove- Huge difference. I drove by the property last night. And I was very much impressed how how clean all those windows looked on the property. And and you did a great job. And you put those in there two, three years ago. And and I tell you, that looks great. Crazy stories. I was at a property yesterday, and I think I may have told you this, that uh, 20 some million dollar property. We're doing the financing on the property. And uh, yesterday was the due diligence piece and the inspection from the appraiser the property condition assessment report, uh, the phase one, everybody came out of the property about nine o'clock yesterday morning. At 10 o'clock the previous night, the main water main broke on the property. And this is a three, 400 unit apartment building. And none of the units going in to go to bed had water in the, in the next morning. There was no water on the property. 
So I came out to the property about nine ten o'clock, and they, you know, the whole place was being dug up. So of all the times that uh, we needed to have the property look good, I had backhoes and diggers <laughs> and groups that were on the property doing labor. And the parking lot was about two or three inches full of mud on the property because when the water comes out, it brings dirt every place on the property, gets everything wet. So I had some depth of dirt on the property. But here's was the kicker on the deal is that everybody who went to work yesterday, knowing that the water was turned off, had probably turned on the water in all their units, whether it was the bathtub or in the sinks. Some of them had put stoppers on there, just they forgot. They were, you know, sometimes they do the dishes and they put stoppers in there and they turn on the water. Well, as you can imagine, when the water turned back on after they had gone to work, water turns on. Floods galore. Floods galore. So on on the day that I have my appraiser at the property, I got water coming on on some of the units. And it didn't happen on all the units, but it happened on a couple of units that uh, now I have big water stains on the top of the ceilings and bottom of the floors with wet carpets and things like that. So and it's they, raining in the downstairs units. <laughs> We've had that before. Too. So where, where people see all this type of stuff is, is crazy. Stuff. I tend to think you're a little bit bad luck in that situation, maybe because I recall you driving through one of my properties with the lender and calling me and saying, Hey, we're out at your property. Wait, what? Is, what is that guy with the machine gun? What's going on there? There's tell that story. So we were out, uh, you know, when we make you a loan, we we tend to also go take a look at the property after the loan's closed, whether it's six months or a year. You know, uh, Fannie Mae has inspectors come out to the property, but I was with one of the Fannie Mae inspectors. I was driving the property in my private car at, of one of Darwin's properties over to Arlington, Texas. We go onto the property. We're just driving through the parking lot very slowly. All of a sudden, I see a guy in a SWAT gear and with a helmet on, with an AR-15, And he's just walking down kind of the driveway. And I'm like, what the hell is that? What is this guy walking with an AR-15? And then I gave him the tip of the cap. I said, hey, all right. I said hello. And I kept on driving. All of a sudden, I turned the corner. And there's not just one SWAT team. There's like six or seven SWAT team members, all with AR-15s, pointing to a bunch of guys that are on on the ground with their hands behind the back. So I'm like, I can't have another (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a bad time where I have the Fannie Mae taking a look at the property. So the Fannie Mae just said, you know, we understand, but you know, tell us a little bit about what the background is and, and what was the background on that? Well, too? the background of that, there was a gentleman that went into a bar, got in a fight, shot up the bar and left, and they were trying to find him. And so they were looking at all his, they couldn't find him, but at any, any of his residences or anything else. So they started looking at his friends. Well, apparently one of his friends lived at the property and they found him there and that particular property. And you have this, I don't want to make it sound like all my properties are crap. Um, (laughs) but, uh, you know, this one, we had to clean up the purple Martians and that guy's friend was a purple Martian. So we had to clean up that property and get rid of those bad residents that had, it wasn't really the residents because we do proper screening. It's the friends of the residents yeah. that we had to keep an eye on. And and we've gone through that process and cleaned it all up. And when you have thousands of units, just like Darwin has had in the past and has right now, is that you're going to have crazy stories. And that's why, that's why I love story time. Talk about um, a property that, that was in a flood zone and a property that you were thinking about buying. Oh, wow. Man, that's a whole mess. We put a property under contract and it was in a flood zone. Well, ironically enough, I had purchased it about four years, five years prior, sold it to somebody else. They ran it and there was an opportunity to go back and rebuy it. Well, as soon as I put it under contract, the seller fired the maintenance guys. So no more maintenance was getting done. No more make readies. The leasing agents weren't doing any leasing. All activity on the property stopped so that he can save money. Well, we started going through the process and said, oh, wait a minute, there's an insurance claim on this roof that we should file. Well, the adjuster went out there and said, oh, you've got a million dollar claim here on your roof. And so the seller said, wait a minute, I want a piece of that. I don't want to do that claim and not get a piece of it. So then we had to negotiate with him for a, a protracted amount of time. And again, during that time, no maintenance, no make ready, no leasing and go through that whole process, have to negotiate with him that he would get a piece of the insurance proceeds, et cetera. 
And come to find out as we get through that whole process that he had a $250,000 deductible. So it wasn't going to make any sense anyway. So we went through that exercise for nothing. And during that time, identified that there was another insurance claim that he was supposed to do the work on that he went ahead and pocketed the money and didn't do the work on. Oh boy! So we had to wait for that work to get done. And so he had to go through, finish that work, get it approved by the city, get it approved by the insurance company before we could move on. Well, this whole process, we have our capital raised. We had over $5 million raised. I had a hundred thousand dollars non-refundable that I put up day one And we're just waiting to close this deal, waiting for him to get all these things done. And we're pressing him every day. The broker's pressing him. We're all pressing him to get this stuff done. Well, it comes down to a week before closing and went out there to walk the property. And he went down and had 25% vacant units and none of them made ready. And we said, wait a minute, you've been bleeding this thing. You're supposed to operate it just like you were before. So to get these units made ready, we need a couple hundred thousand dollars to go ahead and do that. Well, in the meantime, he had other backup offers that were there. And he said, no, I'm not going to renegotiate it. I'm like, this is killing the deal. So I had to walk that deal because he was just a nightmare seller. Every problem you can imagine, he he did. Is there anything that up front, is there anything we can put in contracts or is there anything that we could have done differently? There is in the contract that they need to operate the property in the same conditions that they've been operating it. And quite honestly, there's a lot of sellers that don't. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, I don't want to say greedy, but they definitely watch their nickels. And if it's under contract, they tend to slow everything down. So we try and get deals done as soon as possible. The problem with this one, it wouldn't have been a big problem, but it took them six months to clean everything up. So we do have items in the contract to protect us. But going through a lawsuit and going through doing all that was just not worth it. So my investors didn't lose a penny, but I did. And it's sometimes you make more money on the deals you lose than the deals that you get. Yeah, absolutely. On that one, credible buyer needed. What does that mean? Oh, well, this one was a little while ago. This wasn't in the last three years. This is about four or five years ago. And a property, this was 52 units in Fort Worth Mm -hmm. and it was bank owned. Okay. And it had been under contract three times. And the broker was starting to lose all credibility with the seller. And he said, I just need somebody who's a credible buyer on this thing. Okay. I walk in. It's a courtyard style. I walk into the middle of the courtyard and you can look through the windows on the second floor and see through the roof. Holy cow. Okay. It was in bad, bad shape. There was a chiller system that wasn't working. Most of the units were vacant. Mm -hmm. And it was just a horrible property. But I see such opportunity and things like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Then I made him an offer and I went ahead and and convinced the broker who had done business with that, hey, I'm going to close on this no matter what. And that's one of the good things we've actually, it reminds me of another deal that I'm going to close and I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. So he knew that. So went to bat for me and I put it under contract and closed it. He just needed to have somebody that for sure would get the deal done. So you were the man that was able to close the transaction. Yeah, And that's just like Park Row. Tell us a little bit about that one. Park Row, unfortunately. Park Row Apartments. Park Row Apartments. How many units on that? Park Row Apartments, 205 units. 205 doors. We put it under contract. Okay. And the seller had negotiated something with his lender and he had to get it closed by a certain date. Okay. And I got in there and we had an asset manager there that wanted to use a different lender. And this other lender, which I wasn't going through Paul at that time, huge mistake. And- put it under contract, went through due diligence, raised the money. We're ready to go on this whole thing. And their non-recourse note had so many carve outs that they even had waiver of homestead rights. They had everything to, they said non-recourse, but then they put everything as a bad boy provision. So tell us a little bit about non-recourse, bad boy, and waiver of homestead rights. What What does that mean? Basically a non-recourse loan which I'm sure you've explained this a hundred times, means that there's not personal liability on that loan. If you have a problem with it and you're doing everything you're supposed to, you can just give that property back and not owe the bank anything else. However, the bank has bad boy provisions saying, hey, we're not going to take this back if you were a bad boy, meaning you had fraud, you had theft, you had to fight over it. There's a right. hundred different things. And those are bad boy provisions. But 
this particular lender put every single thing in there that made everything recourse. So even though it was by name non-recourse, they turned around and made it recourse. And on the waiver of homestead rights in Texas, we've got this great thing, this homestead law that protects your home so that lenders cannot go after your primary residence. Well, it's against state law to even waive. You cannot waive your homestead right. But this New York law firm that put together the loan document said, hey, we're putting everything in there just in case in the future we can go after your homestead if you default. We want to have that in there. They also had, if they sell the note and that new note owner loses any money because interest rates go up or anything else, that we're liable for that too. They had everything in there. And we spent a month negotiating these. I spent $50,000 on legal fees negotiating that note. And when finally a week before closing, they pulled the loan. They said, nope, we're not going to give you the loan. It's a week before closing. And so, so I started to freak out a little bit. So and what did you do? I called Superman, Paul Peebles. <laughs> and that. I said, I've got this problem. They just pulled this loan and I've got to close on this. I said I would close next week. So we actually arranged, Paul arranged for me, a, basically a hard money loan to get that closed in a week. So we got a $5 million loan in a week to get that closed so that I could perform. Now, the numbers made sense. We could afford to do it. Things got adjusted, but rather than losing the deal, we turned it into a home run anyway. And that particular property is under contract. And in the 46 months that we've owned it, that one's earned 53.3% per year on average. Again, any numbers that we're saying here, past performance is no indication. No guarantee. No, this is just a historical and no guarantee of future. So what happened in that transaction is that we came in, we did a hard money loan, and we don't do a lot of hard money loans, but in this case, we had to do it because we had to save the transaction, make sure the deal closed. Everybody did not lose money. There was hard money that was in, in the deal. The seller wanted to make sure that the, the deal closed. And the biggest thing was reputation risk. We didn't want to have Darwin suffer a reputation risk of just stepping up to the plate, getting up there, and not being able to close. That would have hurt him in the long run on these transactions. And so we got the hard money loan, got it closed. You were in that hard money loan for how long? We actually took it out a year so that we could refinance it and do a cash out refi. So 12 months and five days later, we refinanced, you refinanced us into uh, agency debt. So, and then you pulled cash out and you got most of the money that people had put into the deal. Yeah. We, that's our business model is the five R's. We recapitalize, rehab, reposition, refinance, and repeat. Well, we budget a three-year refinance. However, in this one, 12 months and five days later, we refinanced, and I think it was about 60% of our original cash to our investors back, and that's refinance dollars, which are tax-free. So in a year, our investors got about half their money back tax-free. That wasn't too bad. Talk about becoming the mayor's best friend. What do you mean by that? Oh, well, we've had three different properties that basically when we bought them, they were the worst properties in the city. And our business model is a little different. We hold for long-term cash flow and over the last 28 years have been through a lot of market cycles. So we understand how to ride those up and down and rather than try and do hit and runs, Mm -hmm. we hold for long-term. So we do our construction correctly. We don't slap lipstick on a pig. We do everything right. Well, the cities are loving us because we go in there and fix it up to a good quality and then we hold on to it long-term so they know we're not just flipping it to somebody else. And in three different occasions, we bought the worst property in the city and turned those around. And now the cities are actually bringing people when they're promoting their city, they're bringing people to our property and say, look what we're doing in our city. Even though it's us doing it and how to fight with the cities at times to, <laughs> to get the stuff done, they're now touting it as how great they are. But we turn these around, get rid of the purple Martians, lower the amount of calls for police, for fire, for any city services. We lower their cost. We do better resident screening so that we have good quality residents in there. So crime's lower. And because we're holding long-term, we have a long-term vision for that property that we're not doing things that are going to hurt us in that long-term. Yeah. Talk a little bit about drug dealers in the front of the property. What does that mean? 
like I said, we're only picking out the, you know, over 7,000 units. Every once in a while, you have something crazy come up. We had one unit that was busted because they were selling drugs out of the front. But they were also filming porn in the bedrooms in the back. You're kidding me. So people rent these things for all sorts of nefarious reasons. And they get somebody to go in there and pass the background check. And then they go in there. So we have to go in and shut it down. And uh, and sometimes we go through the legal process. But in some occasions, we have to do other things as far as killing the traffic. That reminds me of the first property I bought. 14 units occupied, 12 of them occupied by drug dealers. Great. There was more syringes on that property than in a hospital and more tracks going in and out of the property, more traffic than 7-Eleven. And of those 12 units, they were all occupied by drug dealers. If we went through and tried to evict them, we would have had fights. We would have had problems. It would have taken a lot of time. So actually, my partner and I, we went out and stood on the front of the property and every single time that somebody pulled up, they said, hey, here, you go, you're go. you to buy? And they said, yeah, what do you got? We said, no, you're not. We're calling the police on you. Get out of here. So we had to kill the drug traffic so that those drug dealers would just leave on their own accord. Yeah. Going through an eviction process and everything else would have just taken too much time. I think would have been more dangerous than us standing out on the front of the property. Yeah, have you had a lot of you know, roaches on the property or rats on the property? <laughs> okay. I love buying horrible properties because I see so much potential. That same property, that 14 units that I bought, I went into one unit. This is right when we bought it. And do you remember that scene in Indiana Jones where they look down in the pit and they say, why is the floor moving? Yes. And it was snakes. We went into one apartment. The carpet was moving. The carpet was moving because of all the cockroaches underneath the carpet. Oh, my God. That one was horrible. There was another one we had in Arizona that they rented the apartment just so that they could breed rats to sell to. So they were all in cages. Yeah. But they were breeding rats to sell to pet stores. So so, so kids do the darndest things and they, tenants do the darndest yeah, things. Huh? Yeah. There's all sorts of, like, like I said, we've had seven over 7,000 units in over 28 years. So things happen. So walk with us about I mean, <clears throat> putting a better product on the street after you take over the deal? Like how much money do you guys usually spend on these properties? I mean, sometimes, you know, these are bad properties, but they're in good neighborhoods. Right. And tell us a little bit about what level of rehab do you guys do on the property? And for people to kind of understand about what it takes to take a, say a C, C minus property and try to bring it up to a B, B minus property. It's funny. Every year our CapEx budget has grown and grown and grown and grown. And most recently, we've had two projects that are CapEx budgets well over $20,000 a door. And why is that? Well, because we go in and replace everything. For example, the one in DeSoto that we just completed, it was the worst property in DeSoto Mm -hmm. and it needed everything and mismanagement, people that are bleeding the property dry. There's a lot of opportunity in that because you can buy it cheaper and you can afford to put a lot of money into it. And on that particular property, we went in new cabinets new granite countertops, new fixtures, new lighting fixtures, new plumbing fixtures. Some of them, this particular seller said he had no down units. And we went to one unit where the door was falling off the hinges and you walk in and there were six foot round holes in the floor, but he was swearing that he didn't have any down units. I think, And that's what happens on some of these groups that own these properties outside <clears throat> the state, outside the country. They, they just don't come to take a look and see no, the quality and condition of the asset. So it becomes an opportunity. And that may be something that a lot of people should maybe focus on the positive of some of these, these rundown properties. There may be opportunities out there to, to kind of change them. That's where the best opportunities are is in those things that need a lot of work. Uh, just as another example, I was selling, I bought 85 condos in Las Colinas and was selling them off individually. Mm-hmm. And I had two identical units right next to each other. One that nothing was done to and another one that I spent $20,000 on. And it was nice. Well, I sold the nicer one to a person who came in there and gutted everything because they couldn't see the vision, even though they paid more for the nice one and they wanted to replace everything. They couldn't see the vision on the bad condition one. So it's it's just like that. It's human nature. You want the nicer one. Well, we're looking at this saying, hey, there's so much opportunity in seeing these. When I go look at a property, I want to see the worst stuff they have. 
A, I know what my bottom is, Mm -hmm. and B, I know where the opportunity is. This business can be tough where people that are just coming into the business and they are looking for equity to kind of to for people to put money into their transactions, whether it's individuals or family offices. I mean, you've done this for a long period of time. How do you talk to folks about putting or investing money into some of your deals? Again, we're not soliciting for business, we're no, just kind of giving soliciting. Just, just giving an idea of what we do. Yeah. Actually, thank you for the segue. <laughs> the way that we get our investors is we provide free education and I would rather have educated partners than uneducated partners. So we go through and we provide free education every month, usually a free road trip to one of the properties every month. Mm-hmm. And we go through and we tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. We tell you everything that's going on. And every month we give an update on all the different properties. So investors and potential investors can come in and hear everything, see everything, meet all of our team, which we've got a a, a large team, and they can come in and do that. For example, our next meeting is actually on October 9th at Stonebriar Country Club on next Tuesday night. And uh, everybody's welcome to come and learn. And if people wanted to get more information on that, about this meeting that's coming up, you guys do this on a monthly basis, quarterly basis? Virtually every month. We take December off because nobody wants to do anything in December anyway. Sure. And we have them every month. We have them in South Lake, and we're now opening. We're doing some in Frisco. And gives them an opportunity to kind of go through it, to kind of see how you operate the properties and get them educated about what's going on in the industry, what to look for, I would imagine. Yes. What, what makes a good deal? What makes a bad deal? What makes a deal that maybe you have lost money on in the past so they don't do it type of stuff? Out of about 60 transactions, we had one that lost money. Yeah. And we actually tell that story of that on what happened. It was a parade of horribles in 2009 yeah. when the whole market was crashing. But we tell the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we give them updates on every single thing. One of the things, we actually also do deep dives on how to analyze these properties. One of the meetings we went through and we pulled a offering memorandum, the rent roll, and we pulled a co-star report. And we went through, and on my underwriting, on my quick analysis, Mm -hmm. we went through that and showed them how we analyze those numbers and how if we just tweak little numbers here or there, the returns are dramatic. For example, there's one property, Brookside Apartments, which is a large property in Arlington, 288 units. And the exit cap rate, in five years, if we would have plugged in a 6.5% cap rate on that exit, then the returns would have been over 22% projected returns. But I said, hey, wait a minute, we got to project a higher number than that. So we projected seven and our returns went down to about 18%. So just that half a percent on that exit cap Mm -hmm. dramatically changes the overall return. But People don't understand that. So when they're looking at a deal, I want them to look and understand how all the numbers work, how they interact together so that they can analyze for their own benefit, no matter where they go to invest their money. If people wanted to get more information about that, where would they have to go? Uh, Well, as far as for mine, you can go to www.darwingerman.com, D-A-R-W-I-N-G-E-R-M-A-N.com. Or you can send an email to invest, I-N-V-E-S-T, at darwingerman.com. And that goes to a couple of our team members, and we'll get back to you and get you on the list and get you information. The most difficult thing going on right now is trying to capture deals. Whether you're a brand new person going from zero to one or a guy like you who owns 7,000 plus units or so, tell, tell me a little bit about the environment right now, what are you seeing out there? How difficult is it even for you to try to, to get a deal and, and what you're doing to try to be successful in that? There's quite a few hurdles right now. The interest rates on the loans are ticking up. Cap rates have been driven down. There's a lot of capital coming into the markets. And uh, I think there's going to be a big divide between bid and ask as far as sellers still wanting those higher prices and buyers seeing that they can't afford those. Mm -hmm. So the last few years have been real difficult on finding deals. And one of the biggest things is credibility in the marketplace. There's only about five or six major brokers in DFW, and we've done numerous deals with all of them. So one of the advantages we have is we can actually get deals, get them under contract because we've got a great reputation in the market. Whereas if you're trying to break in to do that, That's extremely hard to do to get your first couple of deals because you've got no track record. So it really is an advantage for those of us who are experienced. 
However, the inexperienced who are trying to get into it a lot of times, what I've seen is there's, there's more money chasing deals and they said, I have to buy something. So they're overpaying. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at for every hundred deals I look at, I might put an offer on, on one. Wow. Because they just don't underwrite. So advice to the newbies coming up from zero to one, what you guys have done in the past is that I like this deal. I want to take the deal off the street. Here's a half a million dollars hard on day one. Mm -hmm. You like it that much. I'm committed to the doing the deal and I won't retrade you after we sign the PSA. Talk a little bit about some of that. Well, that's going to happen. You're going to have to put up hard money day one. Sometimes you're going to have to pass that through, meaning that it doesn't sit at the title company. It goes directly to the seller. So they know that you can't get it back no matter what you do. And that also means you're not going to retrade a deal. So you can't go in there with the idea that I'm going to put it under contract and try and renegotiate it. That's in a marketplace that does not happen right now. Most of the time, we don't even have financing contingencies in our deals because we know we can get the debt and we underwrite them and and are experienced. If you're new at trying to do this, breaking in, like I said, is real tough. You're going to have to put up hard money, non-refundable day one. You're going to have to be very aggressive on your purchase price. And then you're going to have to pull out some other stops. Um, some of the deals that I've done, I've actually flown to Denver before to meet with the owner directly so that they knew who I was because they get a bunch of offers. They don't know who who the different buyers are. They rely on the broker to say who they are. Well, if you don't have that track record with the brokers, you got to do something to get their attention. The hard earners money day one, which a lot of 1031 buyers that have to place capital, they're willing to put a whole lot more money down non-refundable. You've got to figure out some way to stand out to make sure that you can get the deal. And it, it's tough. And I think that a lot of people are actually going to get hurt because of the prices of some of these deals and how thin they're underwriting them. Would you recommend some back channeling relationships? Definitely back channeling. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? That means using again every advantage you can. For example, I lean heavily on Paul. Actually, Paul knows everybody in the industry, knows every deal. I'll call him on a property and he'll tell me the whole backstory of what's going on, who the owner is. And sometimes he even says, Well, I know that owner. I'll go ahead and get some information or I'll put in a good word for you, things like that that help. And uh, he's the master at doing that. And uh, if you have a broker that'll allow you to talk or meet directly with the seller, which is how I got one deal is, like I said, I flew to Denver just to meet with him so that he could know who I was, look me in the eye, shake my hand and know I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Is there anything that you would have done differently in the last three or four years or has everything gone pretty well for buying apartment buildings? Hindsight is always 2020. Mm -hmm. If I could go back in time, I wouldn't care what the returns were on the properties. I'd buy everything I get my hands on. Mm -hmm. So this is advice from somebody who's been through numerous market cycles. Right now we're buying for cash flow. We are having forced appreciation, knowing that we're buying things that are undervalued as far as the rents, knowing that we can go in there and increase the value by increasing the rents. However, the underwriting on that has got to be very conservative and there are people that are going to be way more aggressive. So it's okay not to get deals right now preserve some of your capital, still do things. And you need to be more of a sniper right now. Back in 2012, 13, 14, 15, it didn't matter what you bought. And I look back at a lot of deals that I passed on because they did not make sense right then. Deals you could have bought at $16 million and now they're at $30 million? Well, there is one that I looked at day before yesterday and I looked at this property and it was a horrible, horrible property. Decent location, but a horrible property. And I actually looked, went back and looked up. They wanted $10 million for it at the time. And I thought this, th there's no way. And somebody ended up paying $10 million for it. They probably put $3 million into it. And now they've got it on the market for $28 million and huge fortune being made, but it didn't make sense for me right then because we didn't know about the stratospheric rise in rental rates and the extreme drop in the cap rates, which caused these values just to go through the roof. And every real estate investor who's been through cycles like this, they all say, please just give me one more down market. I won't waste it. I promise. <laughs> and, uh, and that's pretty much what it is in those down markets. You've got to buy and say, you know what? I don't care if I'm only getting a two or three or 4% return. We're buying way under value. It's discounted. We'll buy it now and ride it out and make money in the long term. 
Sounds great. But I love story time. I love spending some time with Darwin and, and kind of listening and, and capturing some of his, his stories. If somebody wanted to kind of build a relationship with you, know a little bit more about what uh, the Darwin German group does, again, what's the best way of them kind of reaching out to you? Absolutely. The best way is if you send an email to invest at darwingerman.com, then that goes to Jeremy Wolcott, who meets with every potential partner and goes through to see what they want to do and develop that relationship. It also goes to me if there's any direct questions for me that I can reply to. And I love helping people out. I love giving advice. And that's why I do it for free. And you can come to monthly meetings that uh, that we have. And even if you just send it, like, for example, if you're out of state and you can't come to a meeting, you send us that email, we'll put you on our email list. And generally, we put that whole meeting into an email and send it out to you so that you can participate and see what's going on no matter where you are in the country and get that same information. Sounds great. Uh, Darwin, thanks for spending some time with us, some great stories and story time of multifamily. I've definitely enjoyed it. A couple things. One, don't forget to go to the Old Capital Podcast website, Old Capital Podcast website, and download the 17-page white paper report on multifamily financing. You really would like that gives you kind of a backstory of how these deals get put together. Uh, number two, empowering women in real estate, empowering women in real estate, October 25th up in Northern California in San Mateo, right outside San Francisco airport, Brad Summerick, JC Castillo and our, myself with Kathy Fetke are going to be doing empowering women in real estate. We'd love to see you out there. Again, go to the old capital podcast website and uh, go check in RSVP for that event. If you're up in the Northern California area, we'd love to see you get a chance to uh, build a relationship with you and give you some insight about what's going on. Definitely. So if you have a daughter, granddaughter, a wife, or somebody wants to learn a little bit more about multifamily, that's the place to go just to get some insight. Third thing is that if you do like our podcast, please uh, give us a, a good rating on iTunes or Stitcher. So every thumbs up or like does help us. We appreciate that. Again, we do this information just for you to give you kind of an idea of what's going on in the marketplace. Again, we miss Michael Becker. He wasn't able to attend today. Darwin German, thanks for coming in, sitting in on his behalf. Again, I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.